I want to ask you all, what is iniquity? What is your definition of iniquity? What do you, what do you think about when you think about iniquity? Well, the first thing we need to know, what is iniquity? We need to know, where does iniquity come from? How did it originate? Exactly what is it? Now, in order to understand iniquity, you have to understand what sin is. We have sin, we have iniquity, and then we have transgressions. Now, they all kind of flow in there together, but when you look a little closer, you'll see that there is a difference between sin, transgressions, and iniquity. Now, sin is when you just kind of miss the mark. You know, you might have told a, what they call a little white lie, a little gray lie, but in reality, a lie is a lie. <laughs> it's when you're doing something against someone. If you're doing something against a person, or you're doing something against God. In other words, sin is when you're doing the opposite of what is not right. That's when you get the negative results. <clears throat> so in other words, sin is anything that can fall short of God's glory. Now, let's look at trust. Trans transgressions. Now, transgressions is, <clears throat> is an attempt, is encounters. It's it refers to presumptuous sins. It when you intentionally, willful sin, when you intentionally intend to do what is wrong. We know we're doing wrong, but we don't stop. We do it anyway because we want to, or because we, because we can, or because we like the way it feels to us, whatever the reason. It's called transgression because it is an intentional sin, and we do it, it's willful sin, it's simple as that. Now, iniquity, when you get to iniquity, that's a different. Now, iniquity is deeply rooted. It's, it's a premeditated choice without repentance. Iniquity is, iniquity is ugly. It's all twisted, it's all distorted. It is just plain ugly. And Mekhi, the second chapter, the first verse, it says, woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their bed. And at morning light, they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. Now you know that's something to think about. Iniquity. It's in your power to do iniquity, and you think about it, and you carry it out. And what do we what do we see going on in our world today? What's going on in our world today? Look at the evilness, the lawlessness, how some people are just planning, making plans, how they can destroy innocent people, people they don't even know, people who haven't done anything to them. They just want to do something evil. That's iniquity. It's deeply rooted in them, and they choose to do that. And if you leave iniquity unchecked, then it leads to willful sin, then it leads to a reprobated mind. And we all know what a reprobated mind is. You get to the point that you don't even know what's right or what's wrong, and you just hang it up because you're going to open your eyes in hell. Simple as that. Now, the only force that can destroy the power of Satan is the righteousness that was manifested on the cross of Calvary, which is greater than the simple justification of grace, which is being taught in a lot of churches today. Yes, God is gracious. Yes, he is merciful. But he has rules for us to follow. When we go out there and we uh, run a stop sign, we run a red light, we can expect to get a ticket. We can expect a bad consequence. So therefore, we have to realize that when we serve in God, we have rules to follow also. It's just a natural order of things. It's just the way it is. So God wants us to understand that iniquity is one of the greatest obstacles that prevent us from possessing the riches of God's glory. God has riches for you. He has peace and joy for you. But he wants you to understand that Satan does not want for you what God wants for you. And Satan will do any and everything he can to prevent you from receiving what God has for you. And out of our ignorance of not understanding these curses that come through us from iniquity, we get into a position sometimes that we cannot escape because it's of iniquity, which goes into generational curses, things that your foreparents did, things that are passed on down the line, things that you are not even aware. Have you ever did something wrong and you look at yourself and say, now why did I do that? I have. I said, now why did I do that? And you think about it sometimes, you say, why? See, that's when you get into iniquity. Iniquity is that deep-rooted, ugly evilness that lies within each and every one of us. 
And as you study God's word, you may say, well, sin, iniquity, you know, it's all the same. But really, when you study his word, you see that it's not the same. And when you serve in God, you, under, you will understand that God is very specific. He is very specific. He does not lump, lump them all together. He deals with each one of them. So, and that's what I see is happening in a lot of churches today. I'm not trying to talk about any church, anything, you know, trying not to be ugly or anything. But I'm just saying that a lot of times in churches we deal with sin. But we got to deal with the iniquity. We got to get down to the heart of the matter. We got to get down to the root. Because iniquity, you need to take the knife and take iniquity and just dig it out by the roots and cast it out. It has no place in the life of a Christian. It has no place in a believer of God. And, but in order for you to get rid of something, you got to understand what it is so you can get rid of it. Because you can't cure a problem if you don't realize that you have a problem. And when you're looking at iniquity, you see that in the book, in the Bible, it's mentioned 786 times. So that lets you know iniquity must be important. And what did God say? He said, we perish. My people perish for a lack of understanding. My people perish because of iniquity. And iniquity, iniquity can result in one of the great sources of failure. That's what defeats God's people. And that's iniquity. So, as I said before, iniquity means it's something twisted, it's distorted, it's ugly, it's evil, it's anything that turns you away from God's path. Now, let's see where iniquity originated from. Now, the origin of iniquity was found in the fall of Lucifer, Satan. Iniquity originated with the thoughts of Satan. And we all know the story of Satan, how he was cast out of heaven, how Satan got so prideful, so puffed up, so powerful, that he wanted to be like God. And he said, I'm beautiful. I should be sitting on the throne. In other words, Satan thought he was better than God. He was just selfish. He just... He just was a bad person. He, because he was a beautiful, God created him as an angel. He was his archangel. He was a singer. He was beautiful. And they said his voice was just like, what's the thing? Some kind of pipes. I forgot where it goes in front of it. But some kind of pipes. Anyway, the voice was short. He was beautiful. He was perfect. And he thought of himself as perfect. You know, you can be beautiful. You can be <coughs> this and that. But when he gets in here that you this and you that and you more than this and that and everything, and people need to bow down to you, well, then you got a problem. And see, that's where iniquity originated. It originated in the thoughts of Satan because his thoughts were not the thought of God. When your thoughts do not line up with God's thought, then you have a problem. So Satan, he started to believe things that was different. He didn't want to believe what the word of God said. He didn't want to believe that God created him. He wanted to be his own man. And he said, well, I got this. I'm going to do what I want to what I want to do. So then he began to do what he wanted to do. And that's what caused the friction. And when you look at that, you have to understand just as faith is the substance of what we believe, which is the power that activates the invisible worlds of the heaven, we have to understand that these twisted thoughts that are not of God is what Satan produces a spiritual substance, which is the origin of evil. <laughs> just like your faith produces the works of God, Evil, evil, evil. Satan produces a substance called evilness, lawlessness. In Ezekiel 28, chapter 15, verse say it was saying, Thou was perfect in the ways from the day that thou were created, till iniquity was found in thee. And iniquity is, 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 is some of the roots of our problems that we're having today iniquity that's embedded in us and a lot of times we don't even realize it. Evil is the seed from which all wickedness originate from. And this is the way it happens. Now the Bible tells us that it's transmitted, transmitted to man in birth. So when you have the, the seed and the sperm, the overall that comes together, anyway, conception, make it short. When you have conception, at the time of conception, the man's thoughts are impregnated with opposition to righteousness, to the love in everything of God. So at the same time that man is conceived, his thoughts immediately, 
oppose righteousness. They immediately oppose God. And see, they don't want to love. And what we know that God is love. David said in Psalm 51, he said, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So iniquity is the sum of all those twisted thoughts. It's the sum of all that is evil in man. And it impregnates, impregnates the spirit of man at the moment of conception. In that instant, all the spiritual data, all the spiritual inheritance of evil is established in that person. And evilness, this iniquity, is like a spiritual and biblical cord. It's attached, you know, and it just pulls on into that person. And then it goes from one generation to the next generation if it's not rooted out. You see, this is how sinful legacy of man is imprinted and passed on to his children. And then the children get it, and then they go out and they do whatever they're going to do, their sins, and they add to the iniquity. And then it's passed on. You've heard of generational curses. That's what a generational curse is. The consequences fall from generation to generation to generation. And what are we seeing in our world today? More evilness. No regard for life. Whatever you want to do, you just do it. No regard for God's rules. You know, just, just live your life the way you want to live it. You don't have to answer to God. Where do you expect to spend eternity? So, Therefore, we have to understand the Bible calls iniquity the body of sin. And as we continue in this series, you will understand how iniquity is in form, form in the spiritual part of a man. You'll understand how iniquity affects your behavior. It affects the thoughts. even can affect the health of your physical body. Your body of sin originates in the spirit and therefore invades the soul, the mind, and the body. It's just like mud. You, have a, you go out there and play in the mud. Whatever you touch, it's going to be mud. It's going to be nasty. It's going to be black. But that's the same thing iniquity does. And this is where Satan gets the legal basis. This is where he gets the legal right to attack you because of your iniquity, because of the iniquity that's transferred from the parents on down to the children and then to the grandchildren. He has the legal right to rob, to steal, and try to destroy you. And your iniquity will prevent you from receiving the fullness, the blessings of God. And this is the main door that Satan uses to affect the human being. This is just what he uses, and we understand because we've been taught. Te I've been teaching the last couple of months about opening the door of Satan. How when you sin and you open the door, you let him in about the things you bring into your house. And this is what Satan does. He's always looking for a trap. He's always looking for a little crack just to get a little piece in, just to, just to get in there. And once he gets in there, he permeates your heart, the man's heart, so he can inflict all kinds of perverseness, all kinds of sinful desires. Why do people look at pornography? Why do people just do things they're not supposed to do? And then they wonder why they do it and why they continue to do it. It's because of iniquity. The inheritance of evil has been transmitted and it will corrupt your soul where you would not have the desire to do right. You have the desire to always do wrong. It's like an invisible force. It's, it's just compelling people to commit things that are wrong, abominable sins and stuff. It's that iniquity. Look at this. When you have like, um, give me an example. <clears throat> like my father, he was an alcoholic. And I watched him, I watched Satan take him down to the lowest levels that he could take him. So I saw that, you know, as I was growing up. And then when my father died, he, he, he killed him. Satan killed him because it was two weeks before his body was even found. So he took my father and he destroyed him. And by my father not understanding about iniquity, he allowed Satan to even pass down from his generation and on into his. And so therefore, that seed was planted in you, planted in me for alcoholism. But God is good. God is great. I had a praying mother. And when I taste alcohol, I said, I don't like the way it tastes. It's got to be sweet for me. <laughs> so therefore, I didn't like the way it tastes. I didn't like the way it made me feel. If I had liked it, that iniquity that my parent, my mother had rooted out, it would have been in me. And I would have been in the same condition and even worse. See, one sin leads to another sin. It may not have been alcoholism. It could be something else. 
So that's why it's so important that we understand what God's word is saying. And when we understand what his word is saying, we act upon his word. We be doers of the word. If iniquity is not uprooted, it's just like <coughs> You know, you, you got your home and out in the backyard, uh, somebody planted a tree years ago, and you're looking at the tree, and all of a sudden you start having problems with the roots from that tree. Well, let me back up, get ahead of myself. Some of the limbs start falling on your house, so you go out there and you trim the limbs, you trim the tree, and you cut it down. And then next thing you know, you start having problems with the roots. The tree, you can't actually see the tree, you just see the stump, but the roots are still there. So until you go out there and uproot that tree, get those roots out of the ground, you still are going to have problems with that tree. And so that's what we have to do with iniquity. What did James say? James said in 1 uh, 14, he said, each person is tempted. All of us are tempted. All of us are dragged away by our own evil desires. We all are enticed. And it's not a sin to be tempted. We all going to be tempted. We live in the world. We can't help but be tempted in different things. It's a fact of life. But we do not have to succumb to the temptation. And if we do succumb to the temptation, what do we do? We repent. We ask God to forgive us of our sins. We repent and we turn away from our wicked ways. But if you're in a, a iniquity root that's growing in you, that is causing you to continue to do the same things over and over and over, and you're wondering why you're praying, you're fasting, you read your word, you're uh, talking to other uh, believers, and you're trying to figure out, you're asking God for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what you need to do, and you're still not getting anywhere, you're still staying in that same position. Well, something is going on, and nine out of ten, it's iniquity. And see, the way Satan does, he disguises all of this. He disguises it, because Satan is a counterfeiter. He's a liar, he's a deceiver, and he always comes up with a counterfeit. Now this is what it, God teaches us to teach his word. He sends teachers. What does Satan do? He sends false prophets. Jesus is the light of the world. A Satan appears as the angel of light. Satan takes God's spiritual gifts like tongues and prophecies and causes them to be misused so he can create confusion. Satan is the author of confusion. Jesus is called the Lion of Judah, and Satan is compared to a roar green lion. Satan will deceive you. He will lie to you. He will use any means that he can to send you to hell to prevent you from doing what Jesus is calling you to do. Let me give you a good illustration of that. It was this, um, I don't know exactly where it was, but this guy was somewhere, and so the snake crawled up to him, and the guy wanted to go over to the mountain or the village, whatever, and the snake wanted to go also, but the snake felt like he couldn't make it that far. So the snake asked him, and he said, pick me up, take me with you, and the man said, no, I ain't taking you with me, you're a snake. He said, oh, no, no, but I'm not going to bite you, I'm not going to do anything, I just want to get over to the other side. And the man said, no, I'm not, I'm, 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 get away from it. He started backing up the snake, kept inching up close and close and everything. Please take me with you. I'll do this and I'll do that. He's a counterfeiter. He's a deceiver and a liar. So the man said, oh, all right then. He reaches down. He picks up the snake and the density of the snake was cold. And he puts it in his bosom in his shirt. And he goes trucking along up the hill, down the hill, and through the valley and everything. So he gets to the other side. And he said, oh, I'm mad. So he opens his shirt, shirt up, and he reaches to take the snake out. And what did the snake do? He bites him. He injects, let's see, he injects about 50 milliliters of venomous poison into his system. Ah! And the man drops it. He said, what you biting me for? What did you do? What did the snake say? He said, you knew I was a snake before you picked me up. Duh. That's what we have to be mindful of. We know these things, but sometimes we land into them because of the iniquity that's rooted within us. So therefore, in order to be delivered from this iniquity, we have to diligently, diligently seek God. We have to seek him like we never saw him before. We have to study his word. We have to pray. We have to ask him to reveal to us what we need to know. And when we see or hear something that doesn't line up with the word of God, then we will know it's wrong. When Satan comes to use a counterfeit, if you're in God's word, then you're going to know that's not for me. 
And sometimes God sends people to tell us things. And we need to understand that the Holy Spirit doesn't come to you all the time and say, don't do that. He might send somebody to tell you. You need to listen. When you're praying and you're asking God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, to flow through you, to make your life what it ought to be, when someone speaks to you, then you go instantly know that's the truth. And so therefore what that person is telling you not to do, you're not going to do it. You're going to listen. And when you listen and follow God's word, you make your path straighter, easier. Amen. But you have to spend time with God. So, what does he say? One of the main ways he carries out his evil plan to counterfeit is the good things of God so that people are fooled into thinking that God is not Satan and Satan is God. And we see how this happening. We see it. We see it every day on the news. We see it. So, therefore, we have to be aware of what iniquity is. And see, when Satan comes to you, what does he do? He condemns you. He reaches back 50 years and tells you everything you ever done that was not right and may try to make you feel that you're not worthy to be a servant of God. You did this and you did that. You said that you did this and did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. He's the author of confusion. But when God comes to you, he said, your sins I have forgiven. I will remember no more. And he passes them in a sea of forgiveness. And he tells you that he loves you because he loves you. And he forgives you of your sins. He forgives you of your iniquity. When you go to him and you pray, he will root out that iniquity. And that generational curse will stop with you. It will not pass down to your children. It will not pass down to the next generation. And you can go forth as pure go, knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. Christ, knowing who your path is. See, a lot of times you get that, that friction there. That friction was created at the time of your conception. It's forever present until you root it out. And the way you root it out, the things happen to you is trials, tribulations. Uh, things don't go your way. You went for a job interview. You go to five interviews and none of them work out. Why, why, why? I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Why are the things not happening the way it should? It's because of iniquity. That iniquity has to be Root it out. And understand, I'm not talking to unbelievers. I'm talking to believers because first you have to have a relationship with God and be tuned to the Holy Spirit to understand what this iniquity is all about. It's that evil force. It's that darkness, that blackness that wants to destroy you and send your soul to the pits of hell. That's where it originated. And it's just it's just here, just to destroy you. Satan goes about to and fro, seeking who he can destroy, seeking who he can kill. He's like a roaring lion. He doesn't want you to have a good life. He wants you to spend eternity in hell. Yeah. In hell, H-E-L-L. -L. And you know, we've been studying about the things in Bible study, what happens in hell. We've been studying about the revelation of hell. We've been uh, studying about their torments of hell. And when I read that book, I said, Lord Jesus, please help me, Lord, please don't let me go to hell. I don't want to go there because, you know, a lot of times we don't believe, believe it if we don't see it. But what we got to understand is we walk by faith, not by sight. Because if we walk by sight, we wouldn't have got out of our beds this morning. I still be in my bed with my head covered up. I don't even think I'd be peeping out. Because I can't walk by sight. I have to walk by what the word of God says. And God's word is true. And I know it's true. And I know God loves me. He created me. Last Sunday we talked about how he <coughs> created us in his likeness and his image. He created us because he wanted us, us here for him. To please him. To worship him. To admire him. To praise him. That's why we were created. So God loves us, and God wants the best for you. And he sent his only son into this world to save you from your sins. His son died on the cross. He didn't send us on the cross because once we see him, we, we're doing to death. But through God's grace and mercy and the love that he has for us, he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. In other words, giving us a second chance and another chance and a third chance. Chances on and on and us, on and on for us to repent, to turn from our wicked ways and make him the Lord, the ruler of our life. That's what God wants from us. 
He wants our undivided attention. He wants us to put him first in everything you do. Like I was talking in New Members class this morning. The first thing, the first few minutes of your day, God wants you to spend time with him. He didn't say five minutes, ten minutes, thirty minutes, an hour. He did not put a time limit on it. Aren't you glad you serve a generous God, a gentle God? Don't, let, don't even make demands. You got to go on your job for eight hours. But he said, spend time with me in the morning when you first wake up. When you spend time with him praying, reading his word, it makes your day better. It prepares you for what you have to face that day. You're covered with his blood. You're praying. You're asking that no weapons form against you prosper. You pray in protection over your children. When you walk out your door, you don't even know if you're going to come back home. You don't know nowadays. You don't know. You just don't know. You can be in your car driving down the highway, minding your own business, and somebody is shooting your car because you cut out in front of them when they didn't realize what you're doing. And they get mad and angry because of that evilness that's within them, that evilness that originated from Satan that wants to destroy you. Period. Simple as that. It's simple as that. But we have to understand and know who we serve. We serve a God that loves us, a God that created us in his own image and likeness, a God that would do anything for us, anything for us. And yes, he's gracious. Yes, he's merciful. Even when we sin and mess up, he's right there loving us, picking us up and turning us around, and we go forward. And he loves us so much that he doesn't even remember what we've done. We may remember it, but he doesn't remember it. So this morning, church, I want you all to understand that as we continue with the study of iniquity, you will understand what sin is, transgressions, and iniquity. And you will understand how to take that shell and dig it out, root it out of your life. Out of your life. God wants us to examine our hearts. He wants us to understand the circumstances and the consequences of not living a righteous life. He wants, he loves you, and he does not want Satan to destroy you. And all Satan wants to do is to conquer, to kill, steal, and destroy. We have to realize that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't say, this was finished, that was finished. He said, it is finished. That means completely finished, all finished, and that's all to it. It's finished. It's simple as that. It's finished. It's finished. So you don't have to live according to the way you're to according to generation culture curses that have been passed down through the bloodline. You don't have to live with iniquity, in iniquity. You can live a life that is free, a life of freedom in Jesus Christ.